Are you working in a nonprofit, but having to work extra jobs just to make ends meet? Do you want to make a difference in the world, but are completely burnt out from overwork and underpayment? Do you wish you could leverage your passions to change the world, but on your own terms, having the flexibility to travel and make the money you are looking to make? This is the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. We are building a network of global activists and empowering you to have the freedom to have a thriving business, making an impact in the world without burnout. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. My guest today is Tina Fumo. She is the author of the book, Fancy Prison, Calling BS on the Child Welfare Industry. She tells of her journey as a grandmother wanting to hold her newborn grandchild, but discovering the authorities have apprehended the two-week-old baby and how her family struggled to be reunited. Tina, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank you so much, Tiffany, for having me today. This is such a worthwhile topic and yeah, looking forward to our conversation. Wonderful. Thank you. So can you tell us your story? Can you explain a bit about what happened and how your grandbaby came to being placed into foster care? Well, that's probably the million dollar question. Uh, So my story is I live in Edmonton. My daughter, she was born and raised in the beautiful town of Banff. And when you pick up my book on the very front cover, it shows a, a picture of Mount Rundle. And she grew up, as children tend to do, and she moved to the neighboring province of British Columbia. So five years ago, in 2017, she gave birth to a baby girl. And for the most part, she wasn't really doing that great in that town. There weren't any jobs and the housing, like it was just overpriced housing or not very good value for housing. So she probably needed to get out. And one thing that my daughter has always had trouble with ever since she was a little girl was transitions. Sometimes she needs some kind of motivation to get from point A to point B. So five years ago, here I become a grandma and somebody made some call about some accusation about my daughter in the last month of her pregnancy. And that's a whole other issue itself. I mean, the randomness that anybody can make a call and say anything. But social workers got involved with her in the last month of her pregnancy. And so she thought she had this under control because she hadn't really done anything wrong. So it's like she just figured, well, I'll just deal with them and they'll go away. (laughs) No, they're quite hard to get rid of once that accusation has been made. So my grandbaby was born and we were really fortunate to have a friend who became our biggest advocate. Suzanne, and I talk about Suzanne in Fancy Prison, but she trained as a doula and my daughter had wanted her there in a doula capacity. But what Suzanne ended up being to us as far as an advocate was so much more valuable because the baby was born and then, you know, we knew it was a, a little girl. And then Suzanne just phoned me about 10 days after. There was just a lot of stress, a lot of commotion going on. And she phoned me when the baby was about 10 days old. And she said, Tina, just get here now. In my experience, it's a lot more difficult to get a child out of foster care than try to prevent them from going into foster care. And Tiffany, like my reaction was, what? So that was sort of my first reality advice that Suzanne had given to me about what we were about to enter into. And I was just blindsided. I had no idea. So the story and my book starts off with me driving through this blizzard in March of 2017 to do just that, to get to that town to try to prevent our baby going into foster care and really to get to the bottom of it. But they ended up taking her two days later. So that's kind of the start of our story and the start of our ordeal. That's a lot. So what stories were being told to you when they were in the foster care system? Why was she continuing to be held? What was going on and what information were they telling you that you just needed to accept? They weren't telling me anything. That was the whole point. They were keeping it very convoluted and very confusing. They were trying to exploit any weakness between my daughter and I. And we think the original complaint was my daughter was a meth head and that she was using drugs during her pregnancy. Oh, 
okay, fair enough. That can be investigated. So they coerced a signature out of my daughter to get into her medical records for the last month of her pregnancy. We suspect that they got a hold of uh, the urine strips because the doctors regularly check for pH levels in pregnancy. So we speculate that that's what they did was they went and got these urine strips and tested for meth. They came back clean. After the baby was born, they took a sample of the umbilical cord, same thing, sent it out for testing and it came back clean. Plus the fact that my daughter is telling them, I don't use meth. I never have, I never will. You know, I have a brand new baby here. So she was confused. She didn't understand why she was being investigated for something that just wasn't true. And then when I showed up before the baby was two weeks old, they were in the process of sending out the placenta samples. And again, looking for something that had already been proven, you know, in the urine tests and in the umbilical tests is not there. So you're looking for evidence of meth that isn't there. But I think they were using that to plant seeds of doubt in me so that it would set us up to have a big fight in front of them. And then they would go, aha, you're not a stable Grammy. You know, we get to take the baby from you kind of thing, which it just didn't happen. I mean, I'm summing up in, you know, two or three minutes here. Like the timeline, obviously, I go into a little more detail in my book because it was very fluid, but it was really stressful. It was very intense. So what we were talking about offline was really the comparison with the work that I've done in the criminal justice system and then what you've experienced in the foster care system. And so I'm wondering, why do you think that there isn't more questioning of systems? Why is there just, oh, this person's in a position of authority, I have to accept it. And I don't necessarily mean those that are going through the circumstances at the moment, but why don't we, as the collective we, why isn't there more questioning? Because I'm hearing story after story after story of how the system, whichever system, systems in general, drop the ball. So why do you think that there isn't more of a questioning of this? That's the million dollar question again, Tiffany. I mean, I don't know. I can only really speak from my point of view. and. My absolute indignation of how we were treated and how our human rights were just trampled over. So, perhaps to answer your question, okay, they're trying to treat us and pigeonhole us into this criminal category, but family court is a civil matter. So, that's the gray area there. Like, we're being treated like guilty criminals and we had to prove our innocence. And I just question the human rights. Like we are protected under the Charter of Human Rights in Canada and in the States. And so why are these not being introduced in civil court? So I guess that's the answer to the question. But I think the main thing is that they just confuse the situation so, so much. And rather than judge parents fairly on their ability to parent their child, Parents get judged on their ability to navigate the system. And that doesn't serve the child. I'm sorry. Like a child, when they're born, they don't care what the politics of the country are. They don't care who the premier of the province is. They don't care that Trudeau is the prime minister of Canada. When a child is born, they need their mother or a loving parent. They need to be cared for. They need nourishment. You know, they need so many other things that are not in the realm of the system and in court. So it's disingenuous to expect parents to prove how much they love their children and how committed they are in a legal court of law. It's just an impossible task. Well, you're also looking at the power differential of who has privilege and who doesn't, because of course, those with the higher privilege are going to have more access to the resources to navigate the system. But it's also interesting that you talk about being treated like criminals. I remember I've worked the majority of the criminal justice reform work that I've done has been on the offender side, but I have done some work on the victim side within the US legal system. I've done trafficking work and stuff like that separately. But the one case I'm thinking about was domestic violence. It was domestic violence court specifically. And I remember one of the clerks saying openly that this isn't because, you know, the motto in the States is, you know, you're innocent until proven guilty. But I remember her openly saying, no, no, not in this court. 
you have to prove your innocence. You're guilty and you have to prove your innocence. And so that's what it's sounding like with the foster care children's system as well. And it's almost like we want to protect you so much that you're stifling what you're trying to do and you're doing the harm that you're trying to avoid doing. Yeah. Well, it's the same in Canada too. I think it's that civil court system where you're assumed to be guilty and you have to prove your innocence. But we're, you know, in civil court, maybe you're suing somebody for, I don't know, like uh, maybe a car accident or damages to the car. But we're talking about the future of children, like where they belong. And, you know, where do you go from here? So I think you touched on a very good point too, Tiffany, that the system, a lot of times they'll target poor people who maybe are not educated, who don't know what their rights are, who do not have much access to resources, and they get exploited because of their poverty. And again, I ask the question, how does that serve in the best interests of the child? Is it better to have a child bouncing around the foster system? Or is it better to invest? And to me, it seems like it would make more sense to me to help fix broken families than try to fix a broken system. And I just felt like we were just treated with a one size fits all category. And for whatever reason, I think that they've gotten away from that case management approach where you should look at each individual child with each individual family dynamic and get to the root of the problem. I mean, you can maybe do these surface band-aid solutions, but that's not actually getting to the root of the problem. And it's not, again, serving in the best interest of the child. Yeah. And when you're saying that they target poor people who don't know their rights, who are being exploited, when you were saying that, it automatically made me think of eugenics. I mean, it's like you're trying to just wipe this population out, the disproportion, the disenfranchised, the marginalized. And it's super, super frustrating. And we need to get to the root of the problem. We need to have these tough conversations. And in your opinion, like, where do we go from here? Ooh, I get asked that question so much. Oh, my goodness. It's a good question. (laughs) Yeah, it is a good question. Yeah. Not that you necessarily have all the answers, but... Yeah, I don't. I listened to one of your previous guests about homelessness. And I think I told you just before we started recording that I did fundraising for homeless youth. I think that any approach, rather than look at the old big picture, it's quite overwhelming. You have to look at it in bite-sized pieces. I think that's what he said about the problem of homelessness. So the first step is awareness. I think that my book, Fancy Prison, what I try to do in it is just raise awareness because I want everyone who just automatically goes to, oh, well, if child protection was called, they must have the reasons. No. Okay. So that's number one, what I'm going to start to question. I'm going to start to question your mentality around that because no, that's not the case. I can only speak with 100% accuracy about our case, but they didn't have the reasons for doing it. And whatever reasons that they kept pursuing, they would change them when it suited their narrative to do so, because they were just basically just trying to set my daughter up to make mistakes and fail, which, you know, parents make mistakes, and then waiting for her to make that mistake and then go, aha, you're not a good parent, we're going to take your baby away. Plus, I think in our case too, that there were other factors involved that I think she's the most beautiful baby in the whole wide world. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But she's, you know, she was fair haired with blue eyes. And there was probably and this is hard to prove. And this is kind of the flip side of what you were saying about eugenics. But she was probably a highly, what's the word I'm looking for? Highly coveted. Coveted. Thank you. Okay, you finished the sentence for me. Yeah. Well, I touch on that a little bit in my book, but I don't go into too much detail because I just don't have the stomach for it. But basically, when you take a child and move that child from point A to point B and money is changing hands, so you're taking that child away from their parents and then paying somebody in the foster care, on some level, that's child trafficking. And when you start moving children around like that and they're bouncing around the foster care system. It's just adding to what is already a very vulnerable time in life because children need to be protected. They need to be cared for. And it's our responsibility as adults to care for children until they're old enough to care for themselves. 
it's really that simple. So I really wish some of these policies would get around that <laughs> rather than some of the other wording and verbiage that I hear in, in these policies that just really make something so complicated as loving a child. Yeah. And it's interesting to hear about the story because where I am, I mean, I've been out of this for a few years, but I remember when I was working with the criminal justice system locally, I remember I was a mandated reporter. So I had to make those calls to Child Protective Services. And I remember one case and I had to literally go up the chain of command, begging them. I'm like, you need to send somebody. I mean, there was a myriad of reasons. So it's the polar opposite of what you're saying. There was such lax policies of, oh, no, no, it's fine. No, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. But then it was the opposite of, well, it started to move that way because they got in trouble because that a child ended up dead. And so, you know, I'm wondering, hearing about this, if there is some of that, not to saying that this is right, but if it's a, oh, we don't want a lawsuit, we don't want negative media attention, which I mean, is not okay. There still needs to be questioning and, you know, really trying to understand why the system is doing what it's doing, because it, again, could just do so much more damage, especially when you're talking about it's our job as adults to protect children. And I forgot the term for this, but especially the first seven years, I mean, that just lays the groundwork for going into adulthood. And so when you're taking somebody out that young, it's even more damaging. Yeah. Well, you touched on so many points in you know what you just said about having to report and how there was that one case and oh, so sad that you could see it happening, mm-hmm. but the child ended up dead. But, you know, again, I refer to this in fancy prison. I think that the way the system is run right now is that it's a one size fits all attitude and children are being warehoused and they are not getting the care and love and attention that they need. And they always complain, oh, social workers are overworked. Of course, you're overworked. Rather than investing in families during that, like you said, that zero to seven-year-old stage, which is so important to lay that foundation for families to help them. You know, there's lots of areas that, you know, you just summed it up so well on what you just said. But to me, the simple answer to that is children are being warehoused right now. And it's out of control. I mean, for example, we heard a rumor when we were in British Columbia that when social workers apprehend a newborn baby like they did in our case, because our baby was taken at two weeks old, that they get bonuses. Again, it's a rumor, but somewhere it got started. So, you know, I mean, if anyone out there can confirm this rumor, I mean, like, how is it this front page news? This is just ridiculous, you know, the way families are being treated. And for me, like it ended up costing me my life savings to fight to get back a child who already belonged to us. And I mean, here it is five years later, and we've just celebrated another Easter with her. And I'm okay with that because I can always make more money. I would never be able to replace that child. She is our baby. She is the most precious little girl. And we just love her to bits. We need to even acknowledge there's a problem because from where I'm sitting, that people just don't want to talk about it. Like you said, it's uncomfortable conversations, but these are conversations we need to have if we are actually going to have any kind of effective change here. Absolutely. We need to start questioning the system, all the systems. We need to really look at what's going on. I'm just, I'm thinking about the newborn babies because talking about rumors, again, I've been out for a few years and maybe it's changed where I am that if you're able to leave the hospital with your kid, you're pretty much okay for a little while, despite what allegations have you know, happened before, what children were taken away. If you're able to leave the hospital with that baby, you can breathe a little bit easier for a little while. (laughs) You know, that's kind of the rumor of, okay, I'm in the clear. I've got the kid home. Well, and this is it. Like, I think that they exploit the fact that parents get into that false sense of security. But who needs to live like that? Like when you know that they're watching you and if you make a mistake, it'll cost you your kid. I mean, who came up with these stakes? They are incredibly high and parents make mistakes. I'm so free. Like parenting is not a perfect science. Well, people make mistakes. Yeah, I mean- people are human. We make mistakes, but especially parents. And even if you're doing something, 
for your child, you still question it. It's like, okay, is this working? Is this the best thing? Okay, maybe I should do this. But you know, you adjust, you've got to think on your feet a lot, because children are always growing. It's a fluid situation. And as long as you're not intentionally maliciously putting your child in danger or neglecting them, then that then, then parents do the best that they can. Well, there's also that sense of, okay, well, I need to have job security. So we need to have the quota. I mean, you know how it is with the police on the highways of, oh, it's the end of the month. They got to fill a quota, you know, for that job security. Yeah. You know what? That's fair enough. Tiffany, I'll take a speeding ticket, but don't take my kid. Okay. Right. Do not take my grandbaby. All right. right. Because quota and children in care should not even be in the same sentence. I'm sorry. Yeah. Because in North America, I think then when children are born, there's enough of a commodification of children that happens Mm -hmm. that we have learned to accept. And maybe we shouldn't be accepting this, but a baby's born. Okay. The hospital, the doctors get paid staff get paid. Okay. You take the child home and then you've got what nanny services or daycare. Okay. So then daycares are based on how many children at age levels in the daycare and then they start school. So that's a whole other commodification of children in public school, you know, in a neighborhood and how many children are in the school. That's what dictates how much funding that school gets. Do you know what I mean? So there's enough of a commodification of children that happens that that exploitation of children in the child welfare system. Oh, okay. Well, we're going to take your child and put it in the government care because we can take care of your child better than you can. It's like, ah, no, you cannot love my child better than I can. And from the rates and the numbers of children who are dying in foster care, I really question whether you should be taking care of this child. So what is something that those in the audience can do that have been inspired to take a closer look at children's right in their own regions after hearing your story? Hmm. They're going to read your book. What can someone do right now that's listening? I think just keep an open mind, like start changing your attitude. And yeah, read my book. Think about this being your child. What would you do? You know, because I don't really trash the social workers in my book. What I do is describe their behavior. So easily put yourself in our shoes. What would you do if this was your baby? And then at the end of my book, start asking your questions. Okay, how is this making any sense? And how is this serving in the best interest of the child? So I think if people have that ability to empathize, and just imagine if this was your kid, because people don't seem to want to do anything about it until it happens to them. Don't let it happen to you. Just take that journey with me and just imagine this is your child and then Google it. It doesn't take very long to start Googling about child welfare because my radar, I was not tuned into this until after 2017. And now I see these cases all the time. Sometimes I can see the patterns, can instantly see, okay, what the parent did wrong, not because they didn't love their child, but because they didn't know how to navigate the system. And just keep an open mind when you're reading these things, you know, that just because child protection is involved doesn't mean that, you know, the child is better off. Or that the child's safe. Or that the child's safe. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I guess that's a start is to acknowledge that there is a problem to keep an open mind and just start researching it. Because I guarantee if you just Google it, you'll start to connect the dots on, okay, children bouncing around the foster care system. I think everyone can kind of agree that children bouncing around in the system is not a good thing. So start asking yourself, well, how are they getting from point A to point B? How are so many children getting from being taken from their parents into the system? Okay. Because there can't be that many bad parents out there. It's really the fraction of bad parents are like the one that you said, where you kept seeing signs and you kept going to the people over and over and over again, and nobody would listen to you. And then to finally get them to take it seriously. And then in my book, In Fancy Prison, that's what I say is that they're so busy doing this volume business of warehousing children that they actually don't take the time to investigate a child who really does need protection. Right. So, Tina, where can people find your book? My book, Fancy Prison, it's on Amazon, but probably the best way to find my book, find me and link back to podcasts like this is uh, Google Fancy Prison written by Tina Fumo. Put my name in there and then you'll get to the book. And it has a picture of Mount Rendell on the on the front and a picture of a beautiful little baby, which uh, again, she's not my grandbaby, but she's somebody's grandbaby, I can assure you. And the story about her, Delana Sullivan, is in fancy prison and it is just a heartbreaking story. 
Well, there will be a link in the show notes. And Tina, thank you so much for telling your story, raising the awareness and questioning the system because it needs to be questioned. There needs to be changes. Well, thank you so much, Tiffany, for being on board with this. And yes, we need to start asking the right questions. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. To stay up to date and receive free, valuable resources and action guides, you can find us at humanitarian-entrepreneur.com.